Father, we thank you for all our eyes have seen and heard thus far. Thank you for your presence that is here in this place. Thank you in advance for what you will say to us on today through your word. I ask in advance, Father, move every hindrance out of the way. Lord, I ask for your anointing that makes preaching easy, Father. Word in my mouth, give me what to say and how to say it. I thank you in advance for every person that is here under the sound of my voice. For what you will say to them, Father, speak to somebody's situation, speak to someone's heart, speak to someone's mind. And Father, we will be so careful and mindful to give you the praise, glory, the honor for everything that is said and done in this place. It is in the mighty, matchless, and most precious name of Jesus Christ. We pray, amen and amen. You would, and I'm not going to delay the hour, amen. We know we have some things after service, amen, but we're going to get this word today, amen. We're going to get this word on today. If you would turn with me to the book of Acts, the 17th chapter. Acts, the 17th chapter. Amen. Acts, the 17th chapter. I'm reading from the New Living Translation, so it might read slightly differently than what some of you have. Amen. Whatever version you have. Acts 17. Amen. And when you are there, you can say amen. Acts 17, and we're going to start at the 18th verse. Amen. And this is what, how it reads. It says, Why, while Paul was waiting for them in Athens, he was deeply troubled by all the idols he saw everywhere in the city of Athens. He went to the synagogue to reason with the Jews and the God-fearing Gentiles, and he spoke daily in the public square to all that happened to be there. He also had a debate with some of the Epicurean and the Stoic philosophers. And when he told them about Jesus and his resurrection, they said, What this babbler is trying to say with these strange ideas, he's picked up. Others said he seems to be preaching about some foreign gods. Then they took him to the high council of the city. Can't come up and tell us about this new teaching, they said. You are saying some rather strange things and we want to know what it's all about. It should be explained that all the Athenians, as well as the foreigners in Athens, seem to spend all their time discussing the latest idea because they were philosophers. So Paul, standing before the council, addressed them as follows. Men of Athens, I notice that you are very religious in every way, for as I was walking along, I saw your many shrines, and one of your altars had this inscription on it, to an unknown God. That's what it read. This God, whom you worship without knowing, is the one I'm telling you about. He is the God who made the world and everything in it. And since he is Lord of the heaven and earth, he doesn't live in man-made temples. And human hands can't serve his needs, for he has no needs. He himself gives life and breath to everything, and he satisfies every need. From one man, he created all the nations throughout the whole earth. He decided beforehand that they should rise and fall, and he determined their boundaries. His purpose was for the nations to seek after God and perhaps feel their way toward him and find him, though he is not far from any one of us. For in him we live and move and exist and some of your own poets have said we are his offspring and since this is true we shouldn't think of God as an idol designed by craftsmen from gold or silver or stone amen God overlooked people's ignorance about such things in earlier times 
But now he commands everyone everywhere to repent of their sins and turn to him. Amen. May God add a blessing to the reading and to the hearing of his word. You all may be seated. For in him we live, move, and have our being or exist. Amen. I want to talk to you about the unknown God. Amen. And this, the book of Acts was named such because it records the acts of the apostles after the resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ. And as a matter of fact, the book of Acts is written, but it's still being written. We are living the book of Acts because we're still doing the work of the Lord. And many of the acts of the apostles in the early church are recorded and one of those, Paul, one of the greatest of the apostles, and Silas, who was with him, were co-laborers in the gospel, and they traveled preaching Christ. And as I told you before, if you ever want to see the devil stirred up, start doing something for God. Because all of a sudden, they encountered so much pushback, so much adversity, that they decided to go to another city to let the heat die down. And so the Bible says that Paul and Silas went to Athens. And while they were in Athens waiting for some more preachers of the gospel to join them there, Paul was walking around the city and he was troubled by the things that he saw. <laughs> because all throughout the city, he saw shrines, he saw statues, he saw altars, built to gods and I want you to understand when I say gods I'm saying little G O D S because when you talk about God there's only one <laughs> and I heard I can't remember who it was one of these artists said put some respect on my name and when you talk about God you put a G, capital G on that. And so any other God is lowercase because they are lower than he is. And so he saw altars and shrines and statues all over the city of Athens built to little G-O-D-S, little gods. And it disturbed him. These statues were monuments and altars were built in honor of gods like Zeus, Poseidon, Apollo, Aphrodite, Dionysus. Some of you know Greek mythology, those names sound familiar. And these were who they worshiped during that time. And as a matter of fact, there was a saying if you study the city of Athens that there were in Athens more gods than there were men. Historically, there is an account that they had built over, listen to this, 30,000 different idols to these little G-O-D-S. And an idol is simply an image or a representation used as an object of worship. And the worship of idols, make no mistake, is idolatry. And just like Athens, and I know I got some witnesses here today, America is full of idolatry. So many things we idolize. We build stadiums. We build theaters to idols. Wear jerseys idols. We wear hats. Pay money to go to concerts to worship idols. They had a show. I don't know if it's still on. And they called it American. Oh, come on, y'all. And you got to pick the singer that you idolized the most. And people spend their hard-earned money to buy 
posters and albums and tickets for people that wouldn't know you if you passed them on the street. For people who wouldn't want to give you the time of day. We were in Memphis and there was a singer that my pastor, I was with Pastor Bird, and y'all knew him. And there was a singer and she had her pictures laid out on the table upstairs. And we waited in line to get a picture off of the table. It was Vanessa Bell Armstrong. I ain't gonna never meet her, so I'll tell you. And Vanessa Bell said, Pastor Bird took the picture and she signed it. And she said, that'll be $20. And y'all know Cedric Glenn Bird. He said, woman, we made you who you are. How dare you charge me $20 for a picture of you? And he walked off. I said, well, I guess I'm going with him. I'll see you later. You know. <laughs> but people idolize this woman because of her voice. And I think it's interesting people will reverence these people and it's just a man, she's just a woman with a God-given gift and they will idolize a man over their creator oh God there's a movie and my co-worker went to see it and Wolverine and Deadpool some of y'all know what that is and some of you don't yeah Yes. But he went to see the movie and he said, Oh, I loved it. I loved it. And one of the characters in the movie refers to himself as a type of Jesus Christ. That's what he says. And he said, I loved it. I said, What did you love about it? And he told me. And I said, well, What about this part of the movie where the man refers to himself as being like Jesus Christ. He's all, you know. And I said, I find it funny. Because I know him. I said, I find it funny that you took no offense to that. But I've seen you. Somebody say something about your team. And you ready to fight. I've seen you. Somebody said something against your favorite candidate that you wear the t-shirt and you wear the hat and you got the sign in your yard and you argue for an hour against them but you go to watch a movie and they insult the Lord Jesus Christ and you laugh about it and you're unbothered by it because in the is Islamic religion in Islam it is blasphemy to even draw an il illustration of the prophet Muhammad and in France a newspaper drew an illustration of the prophet and they broke into the newspaper's building and killed some of the staff that's just how serious and I'm not saying it's right that's just how serious they take it but here in America, oh, y'all me. We got movies called Jesus Christ Superstar. The Book of Clarence. Some of y'all know these movies. Dogma. And recently there was a movie that came out called Honk for Jesus. An artist took a cross and put it in a jar of urine and called it art and they put it in a museum. Some of y'all saw the Olympic ceremony that caused so much controversy that they depicted, and they tried to explain it away, but they depicted the Last Supper, which you talked about this morning, and all of the people at the table of the Last Supper were cross-dressers or transgender drag queens I'm trying to be you know I don't want nobody going and googling nothing after church you know I'm trying to drag queens 
And you know, the show went on. I, I think it's interesting. Now, I realize this. God doesn't need anybody to defend him. He is capable. Oh. He's powerful enough to defend his own self. I know I'm nobody. God don't need, Pastor Johnson, God don't need me to defend him. But if you know him, anybody know him today? If you know him, if you have known of him, if you got a relationship with him, him in any way there ought to be a righteous indignation that rises up in you there ought to be an offense when I hear somebody say God D-A-M-E something in me can set off Pastor Johnson because you can damn whatever you want to damn but don't talk about my God Come on, somebody. Something ought to rise up. What is it about us? I, I, I've never heard anybody stomp their toe and say, Muhammad, <laughs> Never heard, heard, heard anybody get mad at their kids and say, Krishna, Come on. But will Jesus Christ Why some of y'all do it. Jesus Christ, how many times I got to quit? Wait a minute. Because of the reverence of his name is being lost. And Paul was trying to defend. See, when you walk in the den of iniquity, and God has called you, and he lives in you, you have a responsibility. And he walked around and saw all of this hedonism and heresy and blasphemy. He said, wait a minute. Somebody got to say something. All this darkness, and I know the light, and I'm not going to speak up. He said, wait a minute. And he walked around, and the Bible said, oh, y'all think you both. He went into the center of town, in the public square, every day, and start preaching. Whoo! <laughs> start preaching to the, to the inhabitants of Athens. And he started talking, and they said, this man is a crazy man talking crazy talk <laughs> and Paul said you men of Athens I noticed that you are religious in every way because I found out you can be religious and not have a relationship with God you can be religious and not be right with God you can brush your teeth religiously, but that don't make them holy. Come on, somebody. He said, y'all are religious in every way. You got statues, temples, and altars, and shrines built everywhere. He said, but let me tell you something. I was walking along, and you got all of these statues built to all of these gods, and something got my attention. I saw an altar with an inscription that said, to the unknown God. You serve what you know not. In other words, you build an altar to something, and you don't even know what you're doing. So Paul said, let me introduce you. Oh, my God. Let me introduce you to this unknown God because you worship him and you claim to be religious but you don't even know the gods that you're serving. Little G-O-D-S. had a co-worker and I'm, I'm going to get where I need to go. I had a co-worker and some of y'all in here may know who he was. He's retired. But he used to wear a crucifix. There's a difference between a cross and a crucifix. Crucifix has Jesus 
nail on the cross. He wore a big crucifix around his neck with Jesus, and I mean big, gold, gold chain with jewels all in it. And he would take his crucifix every day, and he would take it off, and he would kiss it. And then he'd put it into his box and lock it up, and the next day he'd come and unlock it, take it and put it back on his neck. And I watched him do this, and he wore it. Such a dichotomy there. Because he wore this crucifix on his neck, but get the filthiest mouth you want to hear. I didn't say you to say his name. Yes. You know who it is. He said, he just said his name. Yes. So I'm telling the truth. Am I telling the truth? Okay. <laughs> Lord help. Crucifix on his neck. Jesus stretched wide. And the filthiest mouth you ever want to hear. The most perverted mind, am I telling the truth? You ever want to know. And so here he was with his idol around his neck, Pastor Johnson. And it was doing nothing for him. So much so that I'll never forget one day, one of our co-workers walked up to him and put it to the crucifix on his neck and said, so close and yet so far. In other words, that cross, that crucifix is, hand, is hanging right next to your heart, but he ain't nowhere near it. Come on, somebody. So close and yet so far. Never work. Well, that's another story. But <laughs> And he should have known that crucifix had no power because every day he put it on, Jesus was hanging on there. And he never got off. Oh, come on, somebody. Because my Bible tells me, oh, come on, somebody. See, we do things and we don't understand. My Bible tells me that not only is he not on the cross, he's not in the grave and the Bible said that he had that he who hung on the cross was buried in the grave and after three days was raised up and he has now ascended and sitting at the right hand of the Father to the glory of God so if the idol that you built with your hand is still depicting him on the cross come on somebody you need to tell somebody the next time you say, say, I just want to tell you something. That's nice, but he ain't on there anymore. Come on, somebody. So close, but yet so far, and that crucifix did nothing for him. I'm going to show you why. The unknown God. Psalm 115, quickly. This is why cross didn't do anything for him. Psalm 115. Psalm has declared. Y'all there? That was quick. Psalm has declared, not to us, O Lord, not to us, but to your name goes all the glory for your unfailing love and faithfulness. Why let the nation say, where is their God? Our God. Somebody say, our God. <laughs> our God is in the heavens. And he does as he wishes. Oh, he's bad. Their idols, now this is them. Their idols are merely things of silver and gold. Shaped by human hands and this is how you know it's a little G-O-D they have mouths but cannot speak eyes but cannot see ears but cannot hear noses but cannot smell they have hands, but cannot feel. 
and feet and cannot walk. They have throats, but they cannot make a sound. And listen at this. And those who make idols are just like them, as are those who trust in them. Those who have created them are just like them, deaf and dumb, ignorant, no power. That's the reason that a crucifix can't do anything for you. I don't care how big it is. That's the reason a cross around your neck doesn't make you holy. Oh, come on, somebody. That's the reason that a Bible in your hand. Oh, I'm going to go down that road. Oh, my God. That's the reason that having a Bible in your hand can't make you change your ways. Because it's said to be doers of the word. Oh, come on. If you don't read it and apply it to your life, come on. Crucifix, Pastor Johnson. Can't do anything for you. Candle. Burn them and light them all over your house. Make your altar. Pray to them. Pray to each one. Huh? Had a co-worker that lost their keys and say, I'm going to pray to the saint of lost things, lost and found things. I'm telling the truth. I don't know. Now, somebody might have to help me. I don't know the name of him. He said, I prayed to the, and he said he went. and said, I found my keys. I said, okay. Well, but the Bible says that these are just simply things that have been made by a man's hand. I've been to the Chinese restaurant. Every time I go to a Chinese restaurant, there's a fat Buddha. Sitting in the Chinese restaurant. One in particular, right in the front in a fountain around him. Fat Buddha sitting there smiling. That Buddha sitting there when I walk in. And he's sitting there when I walk out. I've never walked past that Buddha and him say, Hope you have a nice day. Hope you enjoyed your food. Because all he is at the end of the day come on made with man's hand no power no ability he's an idol and I'm gonna we laughing but I'm gonna show you and we getting out of here I'm gonna show you another God y'all see this another God who is it? Lincoln is his name. And he's got a mouth. Can't talk. Is that right? He's got eyes. Can't see. Ears. Can't hear. Nose. Can't smell. This is an idol. This is a God. Powerful God. This right here, worship all over the world. You pull this out and it starts talking to some people. I know that this is a God because there's people right now who are worshiping at its altar at work instead of being in God's house. Oh, see, I got quiet in the day. Pastor Johnson. Yeah, yeah, that overtime. Yeah, he gets you. Listen. The God called OT. There are people right now bowing down at the altar of this God 
right here. And as powerful as some people think it is, it's got no power at all. You keep worshiping this God. Let me tell you something. Next time you can't get to sleep at night, lay this under your pillow and see what happens. Matter of fact, next time you worry, you got a headache, lay this on your head. I've learned that this thing not only can it not cure headache, it causes headaches. Hello, somebody. Do I, do, do I have a witness in here? Oh, my God. But I know a God, hallelujah, who can hear. I know a God that can see. My Bible said that this God beholds the good and the evil, that his eyes are in every place. My Bible said that to this God, the darkness is like light. My Bible tells me that there's nothing that is hidden from him. The God that I serve sees the intent of your heart. Oh my God. The God that I serve knows the very thoughts that you think, Pastor Johnson. The God that I serve knows everything. He knows everything about me. The Bible says that he knows my uprising and my down sitting. That there's nowhere that I can go that I can flee from his presence. That if I take the wings of the morning and fly off, he's there. Oh my God. If I go to the uttermost parts of the earth, he's there. The Bible said that if I decide to make my bed in hell, even then, he's there. Come on. And not only does he hear, Pastor Johnson, he answers. Oh, my God. You can talk to a statue all day, listen, and you're not going to get any answers. But I serve a God. Oh, my God. Said, if you call on me, I'll hear you. If you believe on me, oh, come on, somebody. Huh? You have not simply because you ask not. I serve a God that tells me in my Bible that is there anything too hard for God? And the answer is no. He is a God that can do the impossible thing. Oh, come on, somebody. One and true and living God. Paul said he made the world and everything in it. He is a Lord of heaven and earth. He doesn't live in man-made temples and hands can't serve his need. And that it is in him that I live. Pastor Johnson, <laughs> I dwell in him. He is my life. He's my life's breath. It's in him that I move. He orders my step and gives me the ability to navigate this life. Listen, the God that I serve, I know that he's real in such a way that before I make a step, I say, Lord, is this the way that you would have me to go? Lead me and guide me. I will acknowledge you in all of my ways and you will direct my path. It's in him that I live. It's in him that I move. It's in him that I have my being and that I exist. And whether you know it or not, outside of God, you're nothing. Without God, you are nothing. Oh, come on, somebody. Without God, you're nothing. Say, if he's so real, and I'm finishing, if he's so real, why can't I see him? I want to tell you, you can't see him. Open up your big eyes. He's everywhere. Oh my God. <laughs> yes, he is. He's everywhere. He's in all things. Come on. He's everywhere. God is so magnificent and he's so wonderful. He said, I left clues everywhere. I left evidence everywhere of my existence. You ever doubt him? Open up your eyes. If you look, he's everywhere. 
clearly see. I want you, and we're going to get out of here. I want you to turn with me quickly to the book of Romans. How do I know? The Bible says no man has ever seen God. If he's so real, why can't I see him? He said, I'm everywhere. If you would just open up your eyes. Romans, the first chapter. And we leave it. We're going to get out of here. I've seen him. He said, you have? I'll tell you where. Experience his glory. Oh, yes, I have. This is what Paul said last week. Romans 18. Uh, what did I say? Romans 1 and 18. Romans first chapter, 18 verse, said, But God shows his anger from heaven against all sinful, wicked people who suppress the truth by their wickedness. They know the truth. They know the truth about God because he has made it obvious to him. It's so obvious like the nose on your face. For ever since the world was created, people have seen the earth and sky. Through everything God made, they can clearly see his invisible qualities. I said, I've seen God, that's Johnson. I've been to the Grand Canyon in Arizona. And when I stepped out of my car and looked across that vast domain, I said, my wife was there, I said, God is real. <laughs> oh my God. The writer wrote a song that says, then sings my soul, my Savior God to thee. How great thou art. I see the stars, I hear the roaring thunder. Thy power, Lord, throughout the universe displayed that God said if you just look at my creation how magnificent it is how wonderful it is you can see clues about me everywhere said that everything that you see allows you to see my invisible attributes do you know that you yourself are his workmanship come on your sweat glands your eyeballs, come on somebody. Your mind, your heart, your feet, they are his workmanship. What did I say? Where was I at? Verse. For ever since the world was created, people have seen the earth and sky. Clearly see his invisible qualities. His eternal power and divine nature. Here we go. So they have no excuse for not knowing him. Yes, they knew God, but they wouldn't worship him as God or even give him thanks. And they began to think of foolish ideas of what God was like. And as a result, their minds became dark and confused because the answer's right there. Claiming to be wise, verse 22, they instead became utter fools. And instead of worshiping the glorious ever living God, they worship idols made to look like mere people and birds and animals and reptiles. People who don't worship God will go outside and hug a tree. Come on. Same people who don't worship God, Peter, people for the ethical treatment of animals. I, I, I believe in treating animals right, but these same people who don't worship God worship these animals. I think my cat is talking to me. I think my dog is trying to get a message through to me. Got a man, they call him the dog whisperer. Gave the man a show, Pastor Johnson, talking to dogs. He said, and you'll worship and acknowledge a dog? There are countries where they believe cows are divine. And they walking around hungry and starving and got hamburgers and steaks running down the street. Come on, somebody. Worshiping the creature rather than the creator. 
There are people out on the beach right now worshiping the creation. Told y'all about a young lady who used to come to this church and I, she got saved and I hadn't seen her in years. And I said, where is she? I've been praying for her. And I went to Walmart and I had my suit on right out of church. And there she was walking down the aisle with a beach ball and a sundress and her boyfriend and she said, we're going to the beach today. I said, well, it's good to see you. Worshiping the creation. Enjoying his creation, but not the creator. Lord, help me. And so he said, and this is what happens when you get things out of order. Said uh, verse 22 or 23. Uh, 23, instead of worshiping the glorious ever-living God, they worship idols made to look like mere people and birds and animals. And so God abandoned them to do whatever shameful things their hearts desired. And as a result, they did vile and degraded things with each other's bodies because when you become your own God, you make up your own rules. That's what happens. He said, they traded the truth about God for a lie, so they worshiped and served the things God created instead of the creator himself, who is worthy of eternal praise. That is why God abandoned them to their shameful desires. I said, when you are your own God, you make up your own rules. And this is what's happening now. He said, even the women, 2,000 plus years ago, this was written, and it's still happening. Even the women turned against the natural way to have relations, I'll say that, uh, and instead indulge in relations with each other. And the men, instead of having normal relations with women, burn in lust for each other because when you are your own God, you make up your own rules. I know what my chromosomes say, but because I'm my own God, I can make up my own gender. As a matter of fact, I'll be non-binary and I don't have a gender. As crazy as that sounds, but when you are your own God, you have the ability to make up your own rules. When God has plainly said, in the beginning, he created man and woman. That's it. There'll never be anything else. You can die with a blonde wig on. And 3,000 years from now, if they exhume your bones and take your DNA, there's some chromosomes that are going to tell them it wasn't a man, it wasn't a woman, it was a man. Because God designed it that way. But when you are your own God, come on, you make up your own rules. And this is what's happening. Where was I at? Uh, so God abandoned them and said, and men, that's what, well, verse 27, did shameful things with other men as a result of this sin and they suffered within themselves the penalty that they deserved and since they thought it foolish verse 28 to acknowledge God this is what God does he abandoned them to their own foolish thinking and let them do things that should never be done their lives became full of every kind of wickedness sin, greed, hate envy, murder, quarreling, deceptions, malicious behavior, and gossip. Oh, yes, that's in there too. Oh, Lord, help today. Child, listen. Uh, that's in there too. Backbiters, haters of God, insolent, proud, and boastful. And this is the day that we're living in right here. This next verse right here. They invent new ways of sinning. Lord, help me. Disobedient to parents. Hello! I told somebody, if you can't obey your parents, you'll never obey God. Because they're your first representative of God. I tell my daughters that. If I tell you to clean your room and you can't obey me, and God says, now I want you to go preach to the nation, what makes you think you're going to obey him? Well, I get off of that, somebody. You disobedient children. You hard-headed children. Oh, Lord, help me today. Am I talking to somebody in here today? Oh, somebody. I'll just look down. Uh, 
They refuse to understand. They break their promises of hardness and have no mercy. They know God's justice requires that those who do these things deserve to die, and yet they do them anyway. Worse yet, they encourage others to do them too. Verse 20 said, that same chapter, said he's made himself clear to us. So there's no excuse for not knowing him. The only reason people don't know him is because they don't want to. Paul told them, I want to introduce you to this unknown God. And Paul knew something about it. Because Paul thought he knew him. And he was persecuting his church and thought he was doing God a favor. And the way that I know Paul didn't know him is because God knocked him flat on his back on a road called Damascus. And the Bible said a light shone around and he heard a voice and saw nobody speaking. And he said, who is it that's talking to me? And the voice replied, I am. Oh my God. I'm Jesus Christ, the one that you've been persecuting. The Bible said that when he came to himself, coming to the realization of who God is, of his power, the reality of God, when he came to know him, oh, come on, somebody. The Bible said that the scales fell from his eyes and Paul found his purpose. You want to know your purpose? Get to know God. You want to know peace? Get to know God. You want to know joy? Get to know God. I saw a sign and they said, Know God? K-N-O-W. No peace? K-N-O-W. No God? N-O. No peace? No God? no peace but if you don't have them you have no peace amen there was a psalm they used to say without him I can do nothing y'all know that without him I would fail without him my life would be drifting like a shield without a self without him I would do nothing without him I would fail without him my life would be drifting like a shield without a self but with God I can do all things and with God I won't fail and with him my life won't be drifting like a ship without a cell without him everybody's standing I can do nothing without God I would fail without God my life would be drifting like a ship without a sail. There might be someone here today and we're going to go home. The most important thing is not food and games and all of that. It is a relationship with God. And there might be someone here today that under the sound of my voice that has heard the word of God. And to you, he is unknown because you don't know him. Greatest thing that you could ever do is come into a right relationship with this God. 
I'm here to tell you he's real. His power is real. His power to change and transform is real. And if you don't know this God and you want to get to know this God, I want to give you an opportunity to come now. While the blood is yet running warm in your veins, the Bible says the day that you hear my voice, harden not your heart. And I believe that God is speaking to someone in here today. You've been running after idols, little gods. And that's why in your life you have no peace. Come on. You have no joy. You seem to have no direction. Oh, but I cannot tell you everything that you seek, everything that you desire, it's found in him. It is in him. Come on. It is in him that we live. It is in him that we move. It is in him that we have our very being and our existence. If that's you, I want to give you an opportunity to come. The altar is open now. You don't know God in the pardon of your sins. Amen. I want to give you an opportunity to come. Amen. Give you an opportunity to come.